to you, Alex. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. It's good to have you back here tonight. Uh, we're going to have some fun today with our number one presenter of all time, Bruce Waddington is here to tell us about the ins and outs of calibrating PhD2. Um, he's part of a team of people that keep that thing going. I think he's the main part of the team, but he may have other ideas, so tell us about it. Um, let me take you over to some other things that are going on. Oops, got to check there. Share my entire screen. And... Um, As always, I like to start with the calendar. I know it still says that Charles Bracken is a, a to be announced, but in fact, Charles is gonna come back and he's gonna be telling us about capturing the visible universe. And what he's done is he's put together a new book and he put together some new mosaics to go along with it. And uh, he's got lovely, lovely, lovely pictures of um, individual targets, but he's also put the whole thing into a big spread. So he's going to come here and tell us about that next week. And then Astro Backyard's going to be here the week after that. Um, he's actually going to tell us how he does his channel and stuff like that. We have to update this calendar to tell us what the actual titles are. John Tal Talbot's going to come in and tell us about his new CMOS cameras. There's a new generation coming along and there will be, I don't know, another new generation coming along after that. And we're going along pretty good for a while here. But you'll notice that um, in January, we don't have any more uh, presentations scheduled. Uh, we need some more presentations. So I really encourage everybody to hit the contact button. Tell us who you are, what you can do, and uh, you know, show us all your, uh, show us that you can do a program with this. Rory, would you like to tell people, are you still here, Rory? Yeah, I'm still here. Can you tell people about um, the uh, TAIC uh, workshop that's coming up yeah terry submitted ng55 a really cool galaxy there it is there we have till november 20th to submit our data at uh the imaging.org so go ahead and head over there and submit your data um where it says submit finished image here and um we'll take a look at that and if you're open to share a little five minute presentation or something we'd love to have you thanks alex thanks a lot rory um and one other thing that I wanted, there's another uh, ongoing program that we've got going on, and um, it's the spreadsheet here. If you go over to click on our spreadsheet there, your, your program database, um, you will find out that we have been diligently, we, meaning Wanda's doing most of the work here, uh, she goes through and takes all of the programs and she tries to describe them so that you can do something if you want to find out the last time that bruce waddington was here we're going to look up god i hope this works and we'll find there's bruce that's the last program he did for us on 10 10 21 and i think there's there's more of them it's only got two of them there there's two of two Okay, so you can find out the different programs he's been in in the past, and you can get a description if you're looking for a certain uh, thing that goes on in Astro Imaging. You can look it up right here by just, it's a spreadsheet. You can download it to your computer and play with it as much as you want. But that's enough about us and the Astro Imaging channel. Let's hear more about PhD2 and one of our favorite topics, um, how to calibrate the thing. Uh, I got to stop sharing. You ready to take over, Bruce? Yes, I think I am. Uh, Go for it. I'm going to see if I can get this shared correctly. So it didn't work. Let's see. Try this again. Sorry about that. I chose the wrong screen and I want to be here. Bruce, you go ahead and figure out, get your screen going there. Okay, now you're presenting. Okay. And I can bring up what I want bring here. Bring up your PowerPoint. And I can put it in presentation mode. And on a good day, we're going, right? Yeah, right now we're seeing, where are we? My, oh, yeah. 
your PowerPoint's not running yet. Or uh, you picked the wrong screen. All right. Let's try this again. Okay, so let, let's let's your whole screen as opposed stop, to stop okay, sharing. Stop presenting. Stop presenting. Now, yeah. now try it again. Uh, start it again by the square with the arrow going up. Yeah, I, my entire screen. Share your entire screen. You were sharing. Yeah, I did screen. that. Uh, screen one. Uh, uh, that looks like it. Okay. And are we now, there? Now you're sharing the meeting screen. How about now? There you go. They just press the go ahead and play your PowerPoint unless you want to do it this way. Whichever no, way, there we go. Good. Now you're showing the full presentation just as it should okay. be. Okay. Sorry about all that. And you're not That's okay. The beginning. So what I want to talk about uh, today is PhD2 calibration, um, which has been traditionally an area where people have had problems and haven't really uh, had a good grasp of what's going on. So I thought it might be worthwhile to go through this in some detail, and in particular, um, give you some tips and some insights into what you can do if you run into getting uh, calibration problems. So I'm going to start this in a kind of an unusual way. Um, this is a picture of Edwin Hubble uh, back in the late 40s or early 50s. This is a 48-inch uh, Schmidt telescope uh, at Mount Palomar. And as you might imagine, this is kind of a canned picture. He's there complete with pipe. But that's OK. Um, I'm, this is basically uh, guiding without the auto. And I'm going to use this just as a little uh, allegory of sorts, kind of a story behind this. And let's imagine that you are uh, a promising undergraduate student in astronomy, and your uh, your your aide or your advisor at college has has managed to wangle a way for you to get into uh, Palomar and into the dome here. And the idea is that you can kind of stand around and watch what's going on. And your main objective is to stay out of the way and not cause any trouble. And so you're watching this guy over here. And pretty soon there's a phone ringing and it's loud. It sounds like an alarm bell. It's a, it's a phone that's mounted on the wall of the observatory because of course we're 40 or 50 years before cell phones and nice ringtones. So Hubble troops over there and he gets on the phone. He's talking for a while and you're looking at him. And you can tell he's not terribly happy with what he's being told. So he hangs up and he walks back. But now he's actually heading directly for you. And he has a story to tell. And the story is that that was his research assistant that was on the phone. And he's calling in sick and isn't going to make it. And he's the guy who guides the telescope while Hubble does whatever it is he's going to do. And it turns out that this is the last night for Hubble in his time slot. It's his last night on the mountain. And he's not done with the project. And he really wants to push ahead and, and get this thing finished. And so what he's asking is for you to take over and guide this thing. He says, you know, you look like a reasonably fit person. You've got obviously a reasonable amount of stamina. And it would really help me out if you could do this. And I don't really have any other options. So you say, well, you know, I haven't ever done this before. And he says, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. OK, you'll get the hang of this very quickly. And so what we'll do when it's in a few minutes, when it's dark enough, we're going to slew the scope over to a nice, rich star field. And we'll just let you practice for 15 or 20 minutes until you can get the hang of it. And so you say, OK, well, why not? I'll give it a shot. Now, in the context of what we're talking about today, what you're being asked to do is to calibrate the guiding system. And in this case, you're the PhD part of that guiding system. So he goes on his way. You're standing there now with the hand controller and this humongous guide scope. And you have to think about, well, what am I going to do? And it's actually 
going to be pretty obvious what you're going to do. You're going to look through the eyepiece, and they've got you a nice guide star in there. And you're going to push a button, you know, pick one, because you don't really have any way to know, you know, which ones are right ascension, which ones are, are declination. Um, and all the labels have worn off of this thing. So you're just going to push a button. Let's say it's the right one. And you're not going to push it and hold it down very long because you're afraid that if you do that, you might just cause the star to move clear out of the field of view because you don't have any sense of how quickly it's going to move when you push the button. So you do that a few times and you fairly quickly get a feel for how long you have to hold the button down to make the guide star move by an apparent amount that you want in the field of view. And what you realize is that the guide star isn't really moving straight left and right. Uh, it's kind of at an angle. And there's this nice illuminated reticle eyepiece like what you have up here in the upper right hand corner. And you can rotate the eyepiece. And with just a little bit of jiggering around, you can get it to where the guide star stays between the two horizontal, two left and right lines. So if you push the button to the right, the guide star moves to the right. If you push the button on the left, the guide star moves to the left. And without spending a whole lot of time at it, you get a feel for how to keep this thing more or less centered in, in, those, in that reticle. And now you're gonna do the same thing with the up and down buttons. And of course, if in, in all likelihood, up doesn't really mean up, it's, it's got a 50% probability of going down. So that's just an adjustment that you're gonna have to make mentally uh, to remember that. But again, you can, with a reasonable amount of practice, uh, move the guide star around effectively. Now you've got both directions calibrated in your mind and you can cause that guide star to move up and down, left and right, and stay centered. And of course, the, the goal here ultimately is that when they're taking pictures, uh, you want to keep the guide star exactly in the center. So boiling it all down, there were really only two things you had to figure out. One was what direction does the guide star move in when you choose a direction and how quickly, how far does it move based on how far, how long you hold the button down. So sure enough, uh, after about five minutes or so, you've got a nice feel for it. Um, one of the things you might do is with a little extra time, you might kind of check it and make sure if there's any gotchas that seem obvious to you um, and say, well, what are you going to do if things don't work perfectly? Well, this is a professional telescope. You're not going to run into things that are probably hopeless, but some hopeless problems might be that if you push one of those buttons, the guide star doesn't move at all. Or you move the guide star around with the up, down, left, right, but they don't intersect at a 90 degree angle at all. They, they're, maybe they're almost parallel. And in those situations, you're gonna basically have to throw in the towel. You're gonna go find Hubble and you're gonna say, look, I'd like to help you out here, but this thing is unguidable. You know, there's something broken, something needs to be repaired. Highly unlikely in this imaginary tale. But there will be other things that you will have noticed. The first being that when you're looking through this thing, the guide star is kind of bouncing all over the place. And you very quickly realize that you can't react nearly quickly enough to try to recenter the thing every time it bounces. And in fact, if you leave it alone, it mostly comes back on its own. And that's because what you're seeing is just the effects of astronomical seeing, and you can't react quickly enough to try to guide those things out. Instead, what you're looking for is kind of a, a slower net drift or a net movement so that when the star moves far enough out of that center region, it's worthwhile for you to start pushing buttons and push it back uh, where you want it. You might notice, uh, for example, declination. When you 
maybe when you go from north to south, there's just a tiny bit of delay there. And you say, well, that's okay. I can anticipate that. Maybe I have to hold the button down just a little longer in order to get the star moving when I have to change directions. And you'll probably also notice if you, if you hang in there long enough that there might be kind of a slow continuous drift on one or both axes. And that's something that you can react to. It's something you can anticipate a little bit. Now, of course, if anybody has ever tried this, as some of us have, uh, what you realize is that this is kind of interesting and challenging for five minutes or so. After 15 minutes, uh, it's getting to be pretty tedious. And after a half hour or so, you'd really rather be doing something else. You know, your eyes are starting to water, you're getting cold, uh, you, your legs are getting stiff. So there are very good reasons why people were anxious to invent auto guiding systems. But never mind, the real question is, what is the point of all this? You know, why am I telling you this story? And it's because it, the process that you've just gone through is essentially the same as what PhD does. So the calibration process is identical in most respects. And it's, it's very common across all the different guiding uh, applications that are out there. So in the case of PhD, uh, the difference is obviously you're not doing button presses, but you're sending guide pulse commands. Now a guide pulse command specifies a direction and it also specifies a duration. PhD starts out by making west moves. And those are measured and recorded. So the, the west moves matter, and we're looking at both direction and the rate of movement of the guide star as we send down a stream of these fixed length guide pulse commands. Now we wanna move the star back to the starting position at that point, but with PhD, we don't measure that east movement. And in fact, we offer an option that's turned on by default to move the star quickly back to its approximate starting position. So you don't worry about east moves during calibration. And now it's time to do declination and we start with north moves. Now for, for the purpose of this slide, I'm skipping the backlash clearing steps that most of you are probably familiar with. We're gonna come back to that and talk about why they need to be there and, and how they work. But for now, all I'll say is that we now do north moves, just like we did west. And again, we're recording those things, we're measuring them, we're worried about the direction and the rate of speed. And when we're done with north, we just get back to moving south and push the guide star back to a roughly at starting position. We don't record or measure uh, the south movement. So similar to what we talked about before, there might be various kinds of problems or issues that show up when you're doing this, some of which will be basically unmanageable, like the guide star doesn't move at all, or you can only move the star in one dimension or the other, not all four directions. And in those cases, we're gonna have the calibration fail because there's no sense in trying to proceed if you can't uh, operate the, the mount and be able to move that guide star around in all four directions. That's fairly uncommon. Uh, we'll talk about you know, what to do about those things. The more common and less serious problems are simply areas where there should be a warning issued that says, okay, we got the calibration done, the star did move in all four directions, but there's something about what we saw that doesn't look exactly right. And so that's a class of things that PhD will try to handle for you after telling you what the issue is and trying to help you understand what you might be able to do about it. The goal here is to, is to succeed, okay? Now, a lot of people with mount problems feel like PhD is just putting up roadblocks and trying to make this as hard as possible. In fact, it's just the opposite. We're, we're trying to find a way for you to get a successful calibration 
that's at least good enough that you can move ahead and start to do imaging and be able to get further than just being a roadblock at the very first step. Now, here's an example of what a calibration might look like um, in, in this presentation. The red uh, dots and lines indicate right ascension. Green is declination. Uh, now, you'll notice that the axes that are drawn here don't line up vertically or left right. That doesn't matter at all. Uh, and in fact, there's no point in trying to rotate the camera or the off axis guider or what have you to try to make those things line up left, right, up, down. It doesn't uh, provide any benefit at all. What is important is that the intersection of these two lines should be approximately perpendicular. We'll talk more about that. Now you can also see right here that, that there's a certain bumpiness in these, in these points, and that's really just seeing effects. This is a long focal length scope, uh, and so the seeing effects are fairly obvious. None of those matter at all. That all comes out in the wash. So having said all this and uh, explained to you that it's, this is all automatic, doesn't take very long, usually takes less than two minutes. Um, a lot of you might be saying, okay, fine. So what is there to talk about? Why would you want to do a presentation on this? And if you have a well-behaved mount, uh, there's probably nothing further you need to know. Calibration is just a minor bit of, of housekeeping and hygiene that PhD takes care of for you. Um, you can get a good calibration if you're in a permanent setup, you might use that calibration for years. Um, and even if it's not permanent, if it's a repeatable setup, meaning that you take care to put things back together uh, the same way that they were when you did the calibration, you can still reuse it uh, for weeks or months. But the reality is for that a lot of beginners, calibration is a hurdle, it's a headache. And we want to talk about why those problems arise and what you can do about them. So the first class of problems uh, that typically show up is what I refer to as cockpit errors. And these are operational mistakes that people make that interfere with the ability of PhD2 to do a calibration. So examples. Well, the mount is, may not be in the correct state. It may be pointing at the celestial pole. It might not be initialized. It might be parked. It might not be tracking at the sidereal rate. Or it has a huge polar alignment error. Maybe instead of being polar aligned, it's just randomly pointing off at some place in the sky. Those are all non-starters, right? You can't do these things and expect to get a usable calibration result. Hopefully, people can get past these uh, fairly quickly if they read the documentation and get a sense of how the basics are supposed to be handled. Um, other kinds of errors are when things get misconfigured. And this is usually when people use the new profile wizard, which is what we want them to do, but they make mistakes. So they say that the focal length is zero, or more commonly, they specify the wrong focal length. They're using a little finder scope arrangement that has a 50 millimeter objective on it, and they say that the focal length is 50 millimeters. Or when they're asked what the mount guide speed is, they don't know, and they don't know how to find out, and so they just make a guess, or they leave it at the default setting. Uh, probably the most common problem that we see is folks who are using um, EQ class mounts, and there's got to be thousands of those things, and they're using EQ mod, um, the ASCOM driver, to control the scope, all of which is fine. The issue is that EQ mod, by default, specifies guide speeds that are 0.1x sidereal. So those guide speeds are so low 
and so slow that it makes guiding not impossible, but very difficult. So we always want people to reconfigure EQ mods parameters and get the mount guide speeds up at least above 0.5x sidereal. Doing that is often all it takes to clear the hurdle of calibration and be off to the races um, with what you're really trying to do, which is imaging and guiding. And then the third class of problem is just people fiddling around with the parameters, which I, you know, I oftentimes have trouble understanding. Uh, there's no reason to fiddle around with them at all if you've done, if you've used the new profile wizard and you specified the right numbers, the calibration parameters are going to be right. And if you think that you need to change those for some reason, you really need to understand what they are and what the implications are to changing them. And then the third class of thing is what I just labeled inattention, meaning that they're, they're doing a calibration and they're not paying attention to what's happening. And all sorts of wacko events might happen. Um, they might have a whole bunch of lost star events. Uh, they might have a big wind gust. They might have cable snags. They might have parts of the guiding assembly moving around. These all show up as big, huge excursions of the guide star during calibration. And, and you can't have that. You know, this is a measurement process. You want to factor out all these other random events and just be looking at what the mount is doing. The third one is a favorite of mine. This is actually a true story. We had a fellow who ran a calibration and did a ran a guiding assistant run and, and couldn't understand why he was getting such horrible results. And I looked at it and you know the guide star was just all over the place. It was unbelievable. And he said, Oh yeah, I remember that. My wife uh, let the dog out of the house and it came charging out into the backyard and crashed into the tripod leg while I was doing this, which is bad enough. Uh, but what was worse is that he didn't redo it. He just tried to use it. There, so there, there's your first tip. Don't do that. OK, hang on a second there, uh, Bruce. Uh, yes. Eric, do we have any questions coming in yet? I know that we've got a couple of old farts out there explaining how they used to guide. By yeah, there are like no that. questions, but people are talking about, you know, back in the, the 80s, how they used to manually guide. Uh, but I don't see any questions. No, we don't. Want, I don't, I don't think, think we want to go there. <laughs> hey, we do. We do have a request for you to see the little button that says stop sharing in the middle of your screen. Uh, yes. Uh, the. I think you can you can minimize that or at least drag drag that whole thing out of the way. Try minimizing it right there. There we yeah, go. That's yeah. what we were looking for. Okay. Sorry about okay. that. Any other questions out there? I don't see any. Just okay. lots of chatter about in kids, the old days. Yeah. Kids, don't forget that we can um we can ask all the questions we want over there in YouTube, and that's what Bruce is here for. So go ahead. Okay, Bruce. Okay. So, thanks. So we'll move on past the dog running into the tripod. And the second class of problems uh, that gets in the way, uh, and these are basic kinds of problems. Um, and now these aren't operational mistakes. They're not cockpit errors. They're problems with the equipment. And this is where um, things can get pretty frustrating for people. And you know, oftentimes what happens is that they've, they've spent more money than they really wanted to on the mount, and they get it and they put it all together and they take it out and use it visually. And it's just a really slick piece of gear. I mean, it looks great. It, the finish is nice. It slews around nicely. Um, you know, it provides very nice views through the eyepiece. And then they decide they want to go to the next step and try auto guiding with it. And they get problems. So why is that? And it's really because all of those things that they did before were not able to measure the performance and the capabilities of the mount at the scale that is necessary for guiding. So in guiding, we're typically looking at movements of the guide star 
that are on the order of a few microns, typically three to maybe seven microns. A human hair is about 50 microns thick. So we're talking about seeing and measuring tracking performance at, the, at that scale. And that's going to be something that you've never done before with that mount. So this is the first time under the microscope for this new piece of gear. And it can be very frustrating for people to suddenly realize that this freebie piece of software that they got is telling them that there's something wrong with the capabilities of this mount they just spent a lot of money on. And I'm sympathetic to that. But the truth is, uh, PhD2 is just the messenger of the bad news, and the numbers don't lie. So you kind of have to get past that and move ahead to saying, okay, if there are shortcomings, what can I do to either work around them or fix them? The kinds of equipment and setup problems that are most likely to occur, uh, probably the most common is backlash on the deck axis. I, I use the term backlash, it's, it's really a reversal delay. It's what I mentioned before when, you, when I imagined you fiddling around with the 48 inch Schmidt. And that is when you reverse direction in deck, you wanna, instead of guiding north, you wanna guide south or vice versa. There's a delay before the mount engages and actually starts moving. That is probably the most common problem that interferes with getting a clean calibration. Fortunately, it's an easy enough problem to work around and deal with, and I'll talk about how to do that. A second one, is that we still have people who like to do old school guiding, meaning that they use ST4 cables. That's the guide cable that runs from the guide camera to the mount. Uh, and in there, in, with those cables, it's not uncommon uh, for one of the conductors to either break or fail in some other way or to short. And that means you're trying to do a calibration. You might not be able to move the guide star in all four directions. Um, beyond that, the kinds of things you see are large tracking errors in right ascension or a huge amount of drift in deck. And that's typically because you haven't done an adequate job of polar alignment. And then on down the road and somewhat more seriously, uh, binding or static resistance in the drive systems. And this oftentimes happens when people go into do-it-yourself mode and they open up the drive system and they remesh things. It's, it's kind of a natural inclination to mesh things too tightly. And that leads to all kinds of problems um, that again, often become apparent when you're doing a calibration. So the first question, is when do you need to do a calibration? Because I earlier said that you might do one calibration and use it for years if you're in a permanent installation. So let's flip that around and say, okay, when do I have to do one? Well, obviously you have to do one when you've made a new uh, PHC2 configuration profile. You don't have to worry about that because we know that it's new and the very first time you try to start guiding, PhD will start calibrating for you first. If you're, as I said, using old school uh, techniques and you're trying to guide uh, only through the guide camera, if you don't have pointing information available to PhD, meaning you don't have an ASCOM or an Indy connection to the mount, then we don't know where the scope is pointing. And in that case, you're gonna have to recalibrate every time the scope is slewed. So this is the way it used to be way back in the, in the old days. And that's where people became accustomed to that rule. If you slew, you have to recalibrate. Nowadays, there's really no good reason for that unless you're in some very peculiar situation where you can't establish a connection to the mount um, with one of the drivers that's available. Beyond that, you're gonna to need to redo a calibration whenever you make a change in the configuration. That would mean you're using a different focal length, uh, a different guide camera, you've changed the mount guide speeds. And the easiest way to deal with all that is just to rerun the new profile wizard. 
because that wizard does a lot of work for you. It, it not only digests all this new information, but it recalculates what all of the settings should be for the actual guiding. And if you try to do this by hand, you're probably going to miss things and you're going to end up chasing your tail. It's much quicker to just use the wizard and be done with it. Uh, if you rotate the guide camera and or the, the guide scope, you're going to need to redo the calibration. Same thing is true if you have an off-axis guider. Uh, if you rotate that OAG because, for example, you're trying to pick up a brighter guide star or a better star field, that also is going to require a recalibration unless you also have an automated rotator that's part of that. If you have an ASCOM rotator, um, you can connect that, hook that up to PhD, and then you won't have to redo the calibration whenever the thing rotates. Those are, those are not in commonly used, but they're definitely out there. And they there's, there's, a, there's a question that might be related to just this particular issue. Can we okay. take it at this time? Sure, sure. Um, Matt is asking, um, he's got a Moonlight Nightcrawler with an off-axis guider. Yeah. Uh, I can never get the calibration to remain valid after I rotate a target. Right. I connect the rotator to PHD with ASCOM. Uh -huh. And then he goes on, I always calibrate near meridian and equator. Polar alignment is very good. AP 1100 AE encoder mount. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for him? Yes. Um, do, do the test and send us the guide logs because we, we know it works, all right? So there's something wrong with the configuration. Um, I'm not familiar with that particular rotator. Some of the rotators don't follow the ASCOM standard in terms of direction. And so there's a checkbox available in PHD that allows you to reverse direction. We have lots of people using these things and, and it works. So just send us uh, the guide and debug log file on the PhD forum, tell us what your issue is, and we'll figure out what's going wrong. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hold off on those other questions, but this sure. one was just exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, the final thing is that sometimes um, you'll see that all of a sudden, you know, maybe you've, you've taken the scope apart, you put it in the garage, you brought it back out, you reassembled it. Um, you know, you thought you had everything put back together exactly the way it was, but then you start guiding and you start to see a pattern like what's shown down here in the lower right. I think of this as galloping deck, and you see there's a correlation, both RA and deck are going through this unusual kind of a sine wave thing. That's a tip off that something has rotated in the guiding assembly. Now, sometimes this can happen uh, unbeknownst to you. Maybe a fitting got a little bit loose. Uh, maybe a cable tugged on the guide camera. Nothing dramatic happened, but it could cause the, the camera to rotate. And then you're just going to need to fix that and redo the calibration. The next thing is where to do it. And, and by this, I don't mean out in the backyard or in the observatory, I mean, where, where do you want to be pointing in the sky to do a calibration? And this is another thing that people um, struggle with. And again, if you're using uh, just bare naked ST4 guiding, you're going to have to do it on target. Um, otherwise, if, if PhD knows where you're pointing because it has a mount connection, that provides pointing information. What we advise is that you do the calibration within about 20 degrees of the celestial equator. So that means anywhere from deck minus 20 to deck plus 20. And we want you to have, given that it's on deck zero, say, we want the scope to be pointing as high up in the sky as you can do, which means it's going to be somewhere near the central meridian. Now, why do we do this? Well, the latter part, wanting to have the scope pointing up high in the sky, is because we're trying to minimize the, the effects of seeing. So seeing is almost always worst right near the horizon. So at a, at a 
at an altitude of 30 degrees above the horizon, you're looking through twice the air mass that you would if you were pointing up at the zenith. Okay, twice the air mass means twice the seeing disturbances. So we don't want you trying to calibrate pointing down close to the horizon. Now, for some people, it's just not possible to do this. They may be in a forested area, they may have buildings around them, they can't point at deck equals zero. That's okay. All we're saying is do the best you can, get as close as you can. So this is a best practice. It's not a hard and fast requirement. And I'll talk now about why we care about this at all. And it's it's because of something I alluded to before, which is that what we're doing here is a measurement process, okay? And every time, it's just like physics lab, every time you make a measurement, there's some error bar associated with that, there's some amount of uncertainty about that. And the uncertainties come from these little minor tracking errors. They certainly come from all the seeing induced movements because the guide starts bouncing around. And below that, there's, a, there's an inherent measurement uncertainty when we're talking about identifying the positions of the various guide stars. That just to give you an idea, that's usually about a tenth of a pixel. Uh, it can be better than that. It might go down to half that, depending on what the array of guide stars are that you're using. But the point is, it can never be a perfectly accurate measurement. So you take that into account and you say, well, if I have a more or less fixed uncertainty, let's suppose it's 0.2 pixels, then if I have that uncertainty, I would like the measurements to be much larger than that. So I want the guide star to be making movements that are substantially larger than that uncertainty. It's like if you have a, a crummy tape measure and you know you, you can't measure anything more closely than an eighth of an inch. Well, if you're measuring something that's a foot long, that's not that big a deal. If you're measuring something that's a quarter of an inch long, that one eighth uncertainty is a big deal. And, and the position that we've talked about here where we advise you to be pointing, deck zero, high above the horizon, you will see the largest movements in right ascension. And as a byproduct, the calibration will complete more quickly than it will if you're pointing elsewhere. And as we go on, you'll start to see why, um, why this makes a difference, why this can help you avoid problems, and what happens to you uh, when these movements aren't really large enough. So now, if you do a calibration, once it's done, um, what we do is go through some basic sanity checks. Excuse me a minute. Now, back in the bad old days, if the calibration finished at all, that was end of story. You could use it in the way you went. And, and the problem with that is you have no way of knowing, unless you were analyzing guide logs, whether the calibration itself had any flaws in it. And therefore, you might waste the entire evening trying to do imaging with a calibration that wasn't very good to begin with. So we introduced this notion of sanity checks, which I, I'm sure uh, bother people. They may be driving crazy because this is where you start to get the bad news that things are not all going as you'd expect. But the, the advisory messages generally are not that the calibration has failed, but that there it's subpar, it's suboptimal, and you should probably take a look at it and make some decisions about whether you want to use the calibration or do it over or need to do some operational things that I'll tell you about to improve it. What you really don't want to do is just ignore it. And there's also no reason to just run screaming into the night when you get one of these things. All is not lost. This is not a disaster. An example of what one of these things look like is down here at the bottom. And it's it's just kind of a summary of what the issue is. So for in, in this case, we're saying, well, 
we measure the, the right ascension and declination rates, but they don't really line up. They, they differ by an unexpected amount, and that's often caused by backlash. So you could choose to say, okay, yeah, 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 I know what that's all about, and close it and redo the calibration. Or you might want to look into the details a little bit. And then you click on the details button, and we'll give you a sometimes long-winded explanation of what the complaint is all about. So for example, in this case, we're saying, well, you're pointing at a deck of 25 degrees. Uh, the RA rate should be maybe 90% of the deck rate, but yours is actually higher than the deck rate. So that's a red flag. And that means that you have to make a decision. Do you want to just murder ahead and use it? Do you want to throw it away and do another one? Or do you want to roll back and use a calibration that you got done previously? Those things are up to you. By the way, um, in the previous slide, there's, there's also a help button here, which nobody ever clicks on. <clears throat> but if you did, it would take you directly to the troubleshooting section of the manual. And it would talk about all these various calibration errors and what typically causes them. So that would be another way for you to get some more information and make an informed decision about what you should do. At any time, you can always review the last calibration. You don't have to wait around for an alert. And this is under the tools menu to do a calibration review. And what we'll show you again is a graph of, of how the, the various points lined up. And it'll tell you everything we know about the state of the mount and the scope, where you were pointing, what the guide speeds are, what the expected rates would be, and what yours are. And you can see how long they've, you know, how well they line up. You can know how many steps were used in the calibration. You can know what the orthogonality areas, we'll talk about this, basically, to what extent do these lines not form a right angle? You can do this whenever you want. Uh, you don't have to be connected to the gear. Um, you can do it during the daytime if you want. Just go back and look at the last calibration you did and get an idea of how good it was. <clears throat> so let's get back now to some of the simpler calibration alerts. Um, the first being this too little guide star movement. This is not something you can ignore. Uh, it means you basically don't have a calibration that's usable. So what are the things that you would check first? Well, you want to make sure that you've got a reasonable mount guide speed, not this tenth of a sidereal rate that you get by default when you use EQ mod. You want to be pointing in the right part of the sky, as we've talked about. If you are using an ST4 guide cable, it's typically easy to replace the cable. You can do that. And you want to make sure that you're not hung up somehow with a, with a cable. People often tend, especially beginners, don't take into account the need to do a reasonable, rational job of routing cables. And, and cables can be deaf, all right, because they drag across stationary surfaces. They can catch on things. And again, because we're operating at measurement scales of you know, five microns, those little guide cables can definitely cause problems. So you want to make sure that those aren't interfering with the ability of the mount to move and that the mount is otherwise free to move uh, around as it needs to. You can also use some diagnostic tools at this point. I'll come back and say more about this later. Um, but the point here is that the mount has to be able to move in all four directions in a reasonably consistent and predictable way for the same reason that that's what you would have wanted when you were trying to guide for Dr. Hubble. you got to be able to rely on the ability of the mount to do that and to do it in a consistent and predictable way. The next basic kind of an alert um, is also an easy one. You may get an alert that says there were really too many, too few steps used during the calibration. And again, because it's a measurement process, 
the accuracy improves if we have more data points to work with. And this is nearly always caused by cockpit errors. Um, you, you made a bad guess about the mount guide speed. You've changed the mount guide speed without rerunning the new profile wizard. So the, the profile you're using in PhD doesn't reflect the reality of what you've got with the equipment. Or for whatever reason, you fiddled around with the calibration parameters and you've reached a point where there aren't enough steps being taken. This is, is not a common thing for people to encounter. Just as background, our goal is to have each leg of the calibration, well, by a leg I mean or the, the west moves and the north moves, have each of those take a roughly 10 to 12 steps and to cover a total distance of about 25 pixels. And remember, given the little talk here on measurement accuracy, if we've gone a total distance of 25 pixels, then some uncertainties and measurement errors on the order of a tenth of a pixel or two tenths of a pixel isn't of any consequence. So now we can kind of march into uh, a little more complicated stuff. Uh, one is you, you get these, you may get an, an alert that says the rates don't match, the rates don't make sense, meaning that the deck and RA guide rates don't make sense. And, and this comes back to us using, uh, taking advantage of the basic geometry of the sky. So, you know, it's spherical geometry of the celestial sphere, which you don't have to know about or care about. But the point is, that when you are measuring linear distances, which is what we're doing when we're calibrating, as the scope points closer and closer to the pole, those linear distances decrease. And they decrease by a factor of cosine of the declination. So this is a handy way for us to do a sanity check. If we measure the rates in both RA and DEC, and we know what your declination position is, we can know, first of all, that the measured RA rate should be no greater than the DEC rate. And if we apply this cosine term, we can predict what the RA rate should have been. And we use this as a way to ferret out problems in the guide rates. And what we're usually doing is exposing the fact that the DEC guide rate came out too small. And it isn't that there's something wrong with the mount particularly, it's that there's usually been a lot of deck backlash that didn't get cleared, and that causes the calculation of the deck guide rate to be too small. So what do you do about this? Well, as I said, the problem is usually caused by backlash in deck or reversal delay. It takes some of these mounts three or four or five seconds in some cases to actually reverse direction in deck and get the mount axis moving the way you want it to. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and, and those of you who've used the product know, there is a backlash clearing phase in all of the calibrations. So before we actually try to start measuring the north moves, we, we try to make a, a cut at clearing the backlash in deck. And if, if the mount is reasonable, doesn't have a huge amount of deck backlash, that, deck, that clearing process works pretty well. It's actually uh, much more aggressive than it used to be back in the olden days. So we see fewer of these problems, but we still see them. And it's, it shows up when there's a lot of backlash, or the guide speed is again too low. So it may not be sufficient, the backlash clearing may not be sufficient uh, if those two situations are in play. Though it's easy enough to work around this though. It's not a disaster and it doesn't mean you have to instantly tear the, the deck drive system apart and start fiddling around with gear mesh. If you wanna really do it quickly and you're doing it all by hand, you, what you can do 
is once you've slewed over to this region where you're going to do calibration someplace around deck equals zero, if you just do a little short slew back to the north, you're going to clear the backlash in deck. But that's something that a lot of people aren't comfortable doing or they don't think to do it. So what we actually tell them to do is to use the hand control. And what you do is you make sure that PhD is looping guide exposure. So you're, you're watching the guide camera frames come in, you're looking at a star field, and you just press the up button on the hand controller until the stars in the display are clearly all moving. Okay, they're all gonna move as a group in one direction. At that point, you know you've cleared the backlash in deck and you can start the calibration. And that's going to work and that's going to eliminate this suspect rates alert probably 90% of the time. The only downside here is that if this is a problem that's, that's, uh, that's characteristic of the mount, you're going to have to, to do this backlash clearing each time you do a calibration, which is yet another reason why you don't want to be doing calibrations any more often than you have to. My general advice for people if they're beginning is to is to do a calibration at the start of each night session. You can do that even before it's completely dark, so you're not wasting time. Get a good calibration and use it for the rest of the night. And when you're doing it on a one-time basis like that, it won't seem so tedious for you to have to clear the deck backlash yourself. So that then takes us to kind of the last alert that people may encounter. It's probably uh, the most difficult one for people to understand. Hopefully I can explain it to you. And for us, it's usually the hardest one to diagnose because it can come from a number of factors. What we're talking about here relates to the angle of those two lines that, tr that are traced out during calibration, the, the deck line and the RA line, and we want those to form roughly a 90 degree angle. So when you see an orthogonality error, it's e let me explain first of all what it isn't because people do get confused about this. It's not saying that the axes on the mount, the physical axes aren't perpendicular. I don't think I've ever seen this situation occur. I suppose it could happen if you bounced the mount uh, off the concrete or something and broken a bearing, but that's not something you have to worry about. And it also doesn't mean that the optical axis of the main telescope isn't parallel to the RA axis. When, when that happens, that is referred to as orthogonality error. Unfortunately, it's, it's ambiguous. That's not what we're talking about. All we're talking about is what is the angle that's formed between those two RA and deck legs of the calibration, and is it not a 90 degree angle? So what causes this? And it's, I think it's not obvious. Um, most of it comes up when you are calibrating one axis, say RA, and during the time that it takes to do that calibration, to move your 25 pixels, you're getting unwanted movement in deck. So in a perfect world, if you were had full control over this, you want one axis to just hold still while you measure the other axis. And of course, there's no way to do that with a telescope mount that has to be tracking the sky. So if you have a large polar alignment error in the time that it takes for you to do the RA backlash, I'm sorry, the RA calibration measurement, you may get enough drift from your polar alignment error, and that will cause this, these two lines to not intersect at a 90 degree angle. Turning that around, the same will be true if you've got large RA tracking errors that happen while you're in the process of trying to calibrate the deck. The reason that, that we have this fast recenter option is not just to make calibration go faster, 
it's that if you if we reduce the elapsed time that we're uh, operating RA, for example, then that reduces your exposure to seeing um, drift errors on deck that could cause these two uh, calibration lines to not intersect the way we want. Uh, if you have overly small moves on either axis, that is usually a recipe for introducing these what appears to be orthogonality errors. And it's because the, the, the axis isn't really moving around. So the, the guide star is just kind of sitting right around one place. It's bouncing around because of seeing. It's bouncing around because of all these small tracking errors. If you can get that guide star moving at a reasonable rate, then all those problems kind of disappear. You also, again, are subject to cable routing problems, um, circumstances where you've got a cable that's binding or pulling or tugging or somehow or another interfering with how the mount can move. And again, worst case, it might be indicative of, of binding on either of the axes because the, the gear mesh is too tight. So, Remember, in the calibration process, we're, we're thinking perfect world here. Whatever, whatever movement we see of the guide star, we would like to be attributable. We would like it to be a response to the guide pulses that are being sent down for calibration. So when you introduce a lot of other sources of guide star movement, then your, your calibration accuracy is going down and you're more likely to encounter these kinds of problems. So I have a few examples to show you. I'm not gonna beat this into the ground. We're almost an hour into it. Um, this is an example, uh, an all too common example, where the guide speed was, was 0.1x sidereal. And we know this instantly because instead of getting 10 or 12 points along each leg, there's probably 30 here. So these guide pulses are so small that it takes forever to cover the 25 pixels. And then because it took so long, whatever uh, polar alignment error you had is causing drift and deck. So the star, guide star is moving on its own in this direction. And that's why when you reverse direction and go to the east, you don't retrace your steps here. You actually go up at a Johnny angle with the east moves. Okay, so you had a, a couple of problems here, uh, principally being the guide speed is too low and there was a substantial amount of polar alignment error. So another example, and this is one where this actually passed, this, this calibration was fine, but you can see some interesting things here that, that illustrate what I'm talking about. The, all these bunchy points that show up here in this upper left-hand corner those are all part of the attempt to clear the declination backlash. So if, if RA tracking was perfect, you just see a ball of these points where the guide star wasn't moving at all until the deck backlash got cleared. But that isn't what we see. What you see is that it makes this, it has this curve down here. So while that was happening, there was enough tracking error in right ascension that it allowed. It, it pulled the guide star off of this deck line, okay? But as I said, in this case, it, it all came out in the wash. We were able to figure out what was going on automatically. We didn't worry about this stuff and you got a reasonably good calibration. So why am I showing you this? Well, this happens to have been done on the west side of the pier. The very same mount, you know, 20 minutes later, the guy went and flipped the meridian and he did redid a calibration and now he's on the east side of the pier he did fix his guide speed problem well done but look at this mess okay this is not even close to a right angle what is going on here well it's hard to say for sure but the likelihood is that he's got a cable or cable loom that's interfering with the mount's ability to move. He made this worse because he was pointing at the horizon um, on the western horizon. I have no idea what he was pointing at. I don't know, maybe he was calibrating on his neighbor's porch light or something. But 
obviously the mount was not able to move freely in both dimensions. And so he ended up with a mess and an orthogonality error. And the last one I'll show you, because you know these things can go on forever, and we're not going to do that. Um, this is a nice, clean example, though, of how you did the right ascension calibration, and that looks OK. And you start the deck calibration, and you cleared the backlash. But now you get this interesting arc of these green points, OK, instead of it being a straight line. What's going on there? What's going on is that there are tracking errors in right ascension. And you can see that there's some funny business going on here where there's a bunching of points in the right ascension. So that would, that would tells us there may be a lot of periodic error in right ascension. And we happen to be calibrating in a real steep section of that RA curve. Or it could be that there's some other tracking problems in the mount that you need to take care of. But again, this is caught as an orthogonality error when you do the calibration. And the last one is this one, again, not anywhere near a 90 degree angle. And again, this is caused by working at a high deck position. You can see how many guide pulses it takes to move those 25 pixels. And you can see there's all kinds of wandering around going on here. So by the time I'm done with my east moves, I've moved down in deck. So there's a lot of drift in deck, and that was done. That was because when we went and looked at it, the polar alignment error was 34 arc minutes. Now, as most of you probably know, we don't encourage people to micromanage this polar alignment, worrying about whether it's you know 30 arc seconds or whatever. If you get down below 10 arc minutes, uh, for a portable setup, you're probably going to be fine. If you're in a if you're in an observatory or it's a repeatable setup, it might be worth dialing that down. Get down below five arc minutes. Below that, it's unlikely to have much effect at all on either the guiding or your imaging results. So now let's just talk about the remedies uh, that we've talked about. Quick ways to get out of these these messes when you have them. Again, check the mount guide speed. Point the scope in the right part of the sky. Manually clear the deck backlash. If you, have, or if you can't find remedies that way, we go ahead and restore the calibration parameters. Maybe you've goobered something up inadvertently. Maybe you fat fingered something uh, in the calibration uh, user interface dialog. Make sure you've got a reasonable polar alignment. Make sure if you're using an ST4 guide cable that it isn't damaged. The easiest way to do that is just replace it. Take a close look at the cable routing. Nobody likes to do this, but you have to make sure that those things aren't interfering with the ability of the mount to move around. And you also have a couple of test tools that are available to you. And, and the, the easiest one, and ironically, this kind of takes us back to where we started this whole uh, presentation with this kind of silly allegory with uh, Dr. Hubble. And that is there's the manual guide tool in PhD2. And you can go and manually do exactly what I said you might have done with the hand controller of that 48 inch Schmidt telescope. So you would start by saying the guide pulse size is, is automatically the calibration size. So when this is configured for you. So these, when you push a button, in this case, you would get a 250 millisecond guide pulse, which is, is going to be what PhD was using. You click the button west, it's going to send down one guide pulse. You don't hold the button down, you click it, and you wait for it to be re-enabled, and that's one um, west pulse. And you can just watch the stars in the PhD display, and you can you can trace out a calibration. First go west, go back east, first go north, clear the backlash if you want to, then go south. And this is going to be a very direct hands-on way to get a feel for how the mount responds to these guide commands. For example, if you've got an ST4 cable 
you might find that one of these directions doesn't work at all. Now, the other tool that we have for people is what we call the star cross test. And that basically does what, what I've described here, except that rather than tracing out just a right angle, uh, you know, up, down, left, right, it, uh, it sends pulses down that are going to create a cross pattern. And you can capture that with your main imaging camera. And then you've got a record of how the scope responded to the calibration and what it does when it gets guide pulses. And you can, in some cases, share that with the, with the mount manufacturer or the guy that sold it to you and start to, to ask questions that are meaningful, detailed questions about why is it behaving this way. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Hopefully not everyone is asleep and we can take questions if you have them. And I will, if I can find it, um, unshare my screen here. And I'm open to questions. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I think, Alex, you probably have a few and I have a few. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Um, or? Well, I think that the um we would benefit if you would go through a little longer explanation of the difference between um sd4 connection guiding and the kinds of information that one would get with a full um direct connect to the usb port or whatever is communicating with your mountain computer okay good question um with an sd with sd4 guiding the way this was done you know back in the, in the dawn of guiding there's a cable that runs from the guide camera to the mount. There's a, an ST4 guide port on the mount usually. And PHD can use that. And that means that when it wants to say, move the mount west by 100 milliseconds, it sends that command not to the mount, but to the guide camera. And the guide camera in turn has to send we kind of relay that command down to the mount. Now there's already an issue there. First of all, it's a it's a two hop operation. More importantly, there's no logging being done. So we have no idea whether the guide command actually made it to the mount or not. And if it did, how the mount responded. So it's kind of a black box. That's the first objection. The more important objection is that PhD has no idea where the scope is pointing. And that means that it can't adjust the calibrations as you move to higher or lower deck positions. Remember I said that as you move closer to the pole, the RA, apparent RA guiding rates get smaller. And that has to be compensated for, that it's done automatically, if we know what the declination pointing position is. Um, and, and so if you have ST4 guiding and we don't have pointing positions, that's why you have to calibrate, recalibrate every time you slew the scope. And finally, it also makes it harder for us to support you. Uh, we don't know what the mount guide speeds are. We don't know which side of the meridian you're on. We don't know how far above the horizon you are, all those kinds of things are important from a support perspective. So that's why we, we keep urging people um, to use an ASCOM or an Indy mount connection when they're doing guiding. Okay. Does that cover what you're thinking about, Alex? Yeah, the important thing is that with the direct connect, a PhD knows what's going on at the, at the mount and therefore can make better decisions and that's better right value. okay that's right. Yeah. Uh, brian that's going to help with a lot of your questions i think but i think there's some more before we go into them though i want to talk go down to carson's um and he asked does the suggested number of calibration steps differ when using phd with the asi air interface and they use a different version of phd too i'm going to expand that question into something along the lines of what differences would you find between the ASI implementation and the uh, everybody else's implementation of PHD2? 
Well, um, the answer basically is I have no idea. Um, I, I, am, I have no idea what they did with the software. I mean, obviously they gutted it in some respects. I don't know what else they did with it. So that's why on our forum, we don't, we don't provide support for ASI air users. Okay. And I Thank can't you. help you. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, ASCOM and EQ mod, are you familiar with that and how EQ mod changes whatever else is happening with DHD2? Well, EQ mod is an example of an ASCOM mount driver, okay? There's lots of mount drivers out there, Celestron, Mead, Astrophysics, you name it. Um, even uh, Sky, the SkyX and software BISC. Uh, EQ mod is just one example of that. And it, it works on a, on a wide class of mounts, which is why it's it's a popular tool for people to use, um, and if it's configured properly, it works great for guiding. The issue and the one I've been harping on in this presentation is that the default settings for EQ mod don't work well at all for guiding, and so we we have a, a guide published uh, that shows you how to quickly adjust those settings in EQ mod. It's a one-time operation, and then you'll be off to the races and you shouldn't have problems. Okay. And the issue is for whatever reason, and we've asked them to change it and they don't, they, they have chosen a default guide speed, which is 0.1X sidereal, and that's just way too slow for the vast majority of mounts that are out there. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, Brian, that should give you a pretty good hint as to what to look for. And apparently, there's a, a, a RTFM. There's a there's a manual you need to go look up on the uh, where is it, uh, Bruce? Is it's, it in the it's on it's on our website. And and I guess yeah. I should I should put in a plug here now. You know, we have this this PhD two support forum, and it's been active act very active uh, for probably uh eight or nine years so it's it's a huge repository of information where people have asked questions and gotten answers and and oftentimes people are asking a question it's new to them it's not new to the forum we've probably told provided answers you know a hundred times so if you just do it it has a nice search capability so if you did a search for eq mod um you would get all kinds of of topics and answers that show how to configure that. And it would include uh, a pointer to the document that we have on our website uh, and on the GitHub that shows how to configure EQ mod. Thanks, Bruce. I'm going to I'm going to make a comment about the Astro Imaging Channel here. Eric, could you use the time while I'm talking here to make sure we've got all the questions at one point or another? Yeah, but, I um, have a okay hey uh, hang on i just wanted to make this point okay, there are ahead. people who come along later after this uh, after it's not live anymore and uh, they'll tomorrow morning they'll look and they'll ask a question in the comment section of the um the, the astro imaging channel youtube program that's fine do it if you want and many of our presenters do look at their comments and answer those questions but we really don't monitor them as such. And your question may not get answered if you ask it as a comment to the YouTube channel. Your better place to get the information on PhD2 is to go to the PhD2 forum and say, hey, I had a question about the Astro Imaging Channel show where Bruce said such and such. What does this mean? What does that mean? And you'll get a ton more answers there more quickly and probably more authoritative than well, you probably won't get anything from the TAIC comment section on the YouTube. So just that's in mind. Now, Eric, have you got your question ready? Any questions? A uh, couple questions here. What magnitude of uh, RA periodic error can PhD handle easily? Well, um, it can handle just about any. It's just, it's just a question of how good is the guiding result going to be. So, we typically quite commonly see mounts that have uh, maybe 20, 25 arc seconds peak to peak periodic error. 
And with the guiding enabled, and especially with something like the PPEC uh, guide algorithm, we're getting, you know, we're getting them down to below one arc second. Um, it, it's best if you can get a, a permanent periodic error correction model assembled and programmed into the mount. That's going to take that number down by a lot. And it just makes the, the work that PhD has to do a lot less. But, you know, we routinely see mounts that, that have that kind of behavior and people are able to be pretty successful with them. Now, there's another question here. I'm not quite sure, but let me just read it as it's written. Uh, confused, you suggest to guide on a star that's with within 20D of the CE and to aim as high as possible. Uh, that seems like contrary instructions. No, it, it's not contrary instructions. Um, let's imagine that you're going to slew the scope by hand. And so you would first slew it south, maybe, and you're pointing now at deck equals zero. And now you're going to slew it in right ascension. Deck's going to stay at deck zero. And we want you to be close to the central meridian. Okay. So if you if you started slewing west, the scope would just pivot around. It would stay at deck zero, but you'd be pointing eventually down at the western horizon. We don't want you down there. So that's what I mean by being as high in the sky as you can get as long as you're still pointing in that range of deck that we want. The simplest thing is point near deck equals zero and near the central meridian. And the reason we don't say it that way is because we find lots of people that don't know what a central meridian is. Okay, or they think it's the zenith or they, they just don't know. And so maybe we're our own worst enemies, but that's really the way to do it. Get close to the central meridian, get close to deck equals zero. Uh I use PhD too, and sometimes for entertainment, I will watch a calibration or watch guiding. Not as exciting as, say, Netflix, but you know, for some of us geeks, that seems reasonable. I always confused as to how it picks its guide star. Sometimes looking at the star field, it says, well, you should pick this one because it's right in the middle. And it picks one off in the edge, which doesn't seem as bright or too bright. And uh, it's kind of confusing. How does it pick a guide star or even a star for calibration? Well, they're one and the same. And of course, now we're probably talking about multi-star guiding. It's actually a very quantitative approach. And the first thing you need to, to, to believe and, and look at is that a lot of the things that you're seeing on the display that look like wonderful bright stars aren't. They're hot pixels and they're sensor noise. And that's true even if you've done a dark frame and a dark library and done everything you can to minimize them. You can't get rid of all of them. And so PhD has to pay attention to the properties of the stars that it can find. It doesn't want them to be saturated. It wants them to have an appropriate size, so they're not just hot pixels. We don't want to have uh, guide stars that, of equal brightness that are too close together. So if you get two roughly equal sized brightness stars within the search region, that's going to make things prone to hopping between guide stars, so we avoid that. Um, we, we will not choose a guide star that's too close to the edge, despite what you may think, as long as your mount is capable of, of reasonable tracking. So if you've got a search region that's you know 15 pixels in radius, uh, we're not going to choose uh, a guide star that's closer to the edge of the frame than that. So what you kind of have to do is just let go of this, all right, and understand that this star selection process um, is very systematic. It worries about things that are not going to be obvious to you. And most importantly, it avoids um, hot pixels and saturated stars. 
I'm, I'm not going to sit here and make the claim that it's perfect, but it works very, very well. Um, and obviously, I use it all the time. It, it, I'm, I'm working with a 2,500 millimeter uh, reflector, and it picks guide stars for me, and it does a better job than I can do, I'll tell you. Uh, there's another question. Questions seem to pop up here towards the end. Uh, on PH2, there's a readout for RA and then for uh, deck, and then there is a total. What is a good total? For example, my total often hovers around range between 7.17 and 0.35. Well, that depends on the mount, of course. You know, it's it's not really fair to compare a ten thousand dollar mount to a fifteen hundred dollar mount. Um, our goal with PhD is that for for most of the mounts that people are likely to be using, uh, most of the commodity mounts, we we would like to see them have below one arc second total RMS. We can't always do that. Uh, when when that it doesn't happen all by itself, we can usually help them uh, diagnose what the problem is and, and, and arrange a fix for it. Uh, but but one arc second total RMS is kind of a a baseline goal for us. The further you drop down below that, the more you're likely to be sensitive to seeing conditions, which is something that people don't generally have a good feel for. Um, and again, it, it will depend on the precision machining of the mount and how much of an investment you've made. The, the best mounts that we see are nearly always seeing limited and they can get down in the range of 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 uh, arc seconds total RMS. And again, that also depends on where you're pointing in the sky. Life becomes easier the further you get away from the pole. So we like to try to measure these things again when you're pointing near the celestial equator. Um, anything below um, 6 tenths of an arc second total RMS, you're, you're starting to get really top-notch guiding, and you're going to be much more vulnerable to seeing conditions and the local conditions that are around your site. You were going to make a comment about multi-star guiding. Well, I did, uh, because what I was saying is that the, the star selection process um, takes that into account. So we choose a set of stars that are going to have uh, the properties that I mentioned before. They're, they're not too close to another guide star. They are not saturated. They're not hot pixels. They have an appropriate size, all those things. It's, it's the same algorithm essentially that you use if it's single star guiding, except that you now go off and use multiple stars. So should we check the button or? or not. You should be using multi-star guiding, and, and it is turned on by default uh, in the latest versions of the product. I will say there is no way that multi-star guiding can make your guiding worse than it is with single star. OK, thanks, Bruce. Hey, um, we're getting near the end. We try to keep our programs at an hour 15, but you're keeping your audience just fine. Sorry and about you know that. that I, no, that's okay. That's not your problem. We're the ones asking the question. Ben, I'm going to extend it. I'm going to make it even worse. So, you know, um, you've gone the whole time, and I'm not sure that that isn't the first time you've mentioned seeing. I know a lot of people talk a lot about seeing. Can you give us two minutes about seeing and what we what it does and how what we need to do about it or whatever? Okay. Um, Astronomical seeing is basically the turbulence that is uh, caused by movement of air in the Earth's atmosphere. And if you if you go out and, and look at a star and it's twinkling, uh, that's seeing. If you look through a telescope and the star's bouncing around in the field of view, it's not perfectly still. Or if it seems to be getting larger and smaller, it gets kind of blobby, that's seeing. And you know, there's all kinds of interesting physics behind it um, that we really don't have time to go through. 
Um, but those are those those effects happen anywhere from the surface of the ground all the way up to the upper layers of the atmosphere. Now, for the for the professional observatories, what they worry about is the effects way up in the top layers of the atmosphere. And there are mathematical models that talk about you know how seeing can be affected, and that's what they use for doing um, adaptive and active optics in professional observatories. But for amateurs, it's not only those effects. It also has to do with the effects that are close to the to the ground. You may have um, winds and structures around you that cause turbulence in the wind flow. You're going to have heat convection off of hot surfaces or hard surfaces. You'll have tube currents, and those are all things that are that generate seeing effects. And as you might expect, we could do a whole presentation on seeing. Okay. Um, Anak Chan comes in and says he's got a camera with the 31 arc second per pixel. Um, should he bid the main camera and the guide camera too? Okay. Are you, you mean 0 0.3 arc seconds per 0 pixel? 0.31 arc seconds per picture. Or he says seconds okay. per pixel. Yeah. Okay. And that's on the main camera? He said he has an OTA slash camera. And he's okay. asking what he should do with the guide camera. Should he should he bend that too? Okay. Yes. We we generate if I understand what he's asking, we, we want the image scale of the guider to generally be no less than 0 0.5 arc seconds per pixel. So he should he should bin it in that case. He could get it up even to one arc second per pixel and not uh, pay a penalty for that. Okay. And by binning it, he may get better signal to noise ratio. He may be able to get a better selection of stars to work with for guiding. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Astro Nerd, your favorite Astro Nerd, says that he'll pay somebody to come get his PhD working right. He's just happened. Um, if you have a direct connection, should you not use the ST4 connection? Correct. Right. You, yes, you want to take you. You don't want to have both of those cables there. You don't want a, a cable in that case from the guide camera to the mount. There are some cameras uh, that actually can send uh, unwanted signals down that guide cable, and that really messes things up uh, if you're not guiding through that cable. So yes, don't don't do that. And Eric, we done. I think we're done. I it's my bedtime done. here. Jeez. <laughs> it's all and about you're in, bedtime. And you're in California. Can you imagine what those guys back east are doing right now? Um, so next week, Charles Bracken's going to come tell us a whole lot of stuff about imaging the visible universe with the beautiful mosaic that he's got. And we're always looking for more presenters. I want to thank Bruce for doing a great job. Um, uh, this This will, again, be one of the top well, probably the top program for the year, as you always do. So thank you very much, Bruce. Well, thank you. I always appreciate the invitation, and I'm happy to help okay. you out. Okay. See you. Who's next? Uh, everybody ready to go? Uh, Terry's been running the show tonight, so thank you, Terry, for doing that. Thank you, Michael Covington, for jumping in and explaining some of the things along the side. Uh, you're one of the pros. We really appreciate you being here and helping out. And the whole conversation for all the people that were going on over there. A little confusing for me at times, but, you know. Um, thank you, and good night, everybody. Terry, take us out. <laughs>